Very good morning to you. Welcome to the Morning Brief right here on Channels Television. It's day 17, right? In the month of September, Tuesday. It is right here in Lagos, Nigeria. And we're super excited to have you back at work. We've been waiting for you at work. Thank you for coming. <laughs> I'm Jeffrey Zama. <laughs> yes, indeed. We get the message, Jeffrey. Good morning. It's Tuesday. Welcome to the Morning Brief right here on Channels Television. And we're live for you here in Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. I am Bukola Koka. You know, it felt like a long weekend, three-day weekend. So this mm. is like a Monday, except that it's a Tuesday, but it feels like a Monday. Welcome back to work, Ramidel Maloud. Celebration. I'm Kayo Okikulu, and we have a package for you today. Lots of it. So, what's been going on, Bukala, from your end? Uh, I've been buying petrol at 1,100 naira per liter because what? as you go further down um, on the expressway away old from stock Lagos. Old stock or new stock? You don't know yet. Uh, well, <laughs> old stock. Old stock, Jeffrey. Old stock. Before the announcement of the uh, Dungo Tay pump price, 1,100 naira per liter. And you know, uh, the wow. bigger your car, the bigger the capacity to take in a lot of fuel. But that's the reality that we find ourselves in today. <sighs> and, you know, when we had the conversation with Ipman yesterday, he was saying that, well, it doesn't quite make sense for us to be, uh, for imported fuel to be cheaper than fuel produced or at least refined right here in the country. I know there's a lot of back and forth, but for people like you who are buying for a thousand plus, getting it for 950 is better. Is better. And that has been uh, the, the concern. Once people see prices go up, they know that this has come to stay. Once they see fuel scarcity, they know that this is tied to prices clearly. Um, so that's where we are. I think about three price increases this year alone. This has been a very, very tricky year for Nigerians, particularly with the pricing of petrol. I, I know that there's a, there's a soft side of things on social mm -hmm. media. You know, people, Nigerians as usual, uh, approaching uh, issues, you know, this is a very tricky one, but I'll just tell you. So there's this thing trending on social media. Um, people have watched a lot of people give testimonies uh, in, in a certain church. And, you know, the way they give the testimonies, some people don't, don't think it's true. While other people say, well, this is my experience. Let me share the experience. So for every difficulty that Adrian's face now, they will approach <laughs> that difficulty and, and utter a certain phrase and expect those things to change. So that's how a lot of people are approaching pump price increase, no food in the cupboard, they, 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 they say that phrase, and it's just quite interesting how Nigerians can be. But, Jeffrey, how much are you buying petrol? Okay, I bought it yesterday for 950. Uh, I guess it's the old stock as well. well new stock, uh, right. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually, my car, there was still fuel in my car, and I bought like 50 grand, 50k. The, that's when the car uh, tank got full. I said, I had fuel already. All right. And I swear, this is, this is the car that used to be filled with like 13,000 naira before uh, President Tinubu came. 13,000 naira. Mm -hmm. Then I didn't even know how much they used to buy a liter of foil. I just, just drive, drive like a desiccant. I just drive and say, fill the tank because I just know that oh, it can't be more than 13, 14, you know. And at the end of the day, with 50,000, mm. uh, there are still some space. Mm -hmm. uh, for, I feel it's already inside. So mm. that's the reality. So uh, my guess is that with, uh, that tank now will be filled with between 60 to 65, maybe 70,000 naira. But this is what, what is going on. And this is where I would appeal to all of the people involved to stop playing politics because mm. there's clearly politics going on with this whole Dangote NMPCL issue. So. That, uh, NMPCL had come out to say we bought it for eight nine eight uh, naira uh, at, the, at the end of the landing cost. Landing cost me everything we paid for the product cost, the premium. NMPCL uh, down to the refinery came and said no, the, not really. Uh, we bought it in dollar. You, we sold it in dollar to you. So maybe you will speak the language in dollar. NMPCL later came out and said okay, this is a breakdown. Uh, Ten ppm is all bought it. Four and in Lagos it will land at 950. Uh, I spoke to guys, I spoke to Kyle, uh, what's his name, Pius Angbo yesterday from McCordy. Uh. He said the one they have in stock is 897 naira right now. Mm. But we know that when this one they bought from uh, Dunkley Refinery gets there, it will be about, about a thousand naira. But whether NMPCL agrees or not, this is what is not making sense to a lot of us. So this is what we're proposing. You have come out with the breakdown of how you bought fuel from Dangote Refinery. The imported one also give us a breakdown. 
Since Dangote may not want to come out with how much he sold you, mm. uh, for whatever reason, because it's a private business, it has competitors, but it would be nice if Dangote as well brings out his price, how much he sold you per liter. Mm. So, now this breakdown the NNPCL has given you, we are challenging NNPCL, also bring the breakdown of how much you buy imported fuel. And the, because there is no and the way... the effort used yes. to convert the, the amount. Right? Yes, the effort used in converting those mm -hmm. amounts and the disparity. That's the FX. The, yes, the, the FX the rate. Yeah. There is, it is difficult to believe, I stand to be corrected, it is difficult to believe that imported fuel will be cheaper than one, the one refined here mm -hmm. in Nigeria. <clears throat> So because at the end of the day, when you look at how much, because we understand they have to come and debunk that, uh, this is 55 cents. I think the other one is about 70 cents, which will land over 1,000 naira. So how come they are selling for less than 900 if they are not paying subsidy? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a bit tricky to be challenging Dangote petrol with what has been subsidized that is imported. Mm -hmm. That is the argument right now. Can NMPC be bold enough? What you did, what you've done with the breakdown we just saw with the Dangote refinery, all of the petrol you're importing, from wherever you're importing it, bring it out. Give us that breakdown. When Dangote says it says plus 10 ppm, specific, uh, what do you call it, uh, the grade of yeah. the petrol. Let's also see that grading, and let's see how much your breakdown came to. Let's see and do the comparison because on one hand there's also the argument of let's not have one source of uh, what do you call it now, source of. Uh, one and, supplier, uh, yeah, right? supplier. Yeah, supplier. It's great to have that idea. But the where I'm making the argument is if you're not making comparison between Dangote Refinery, which is purely deregulated, as against the one that you pay subsidy, does it make sense? Doesn't or under recovery or short for short for short or recovery. just subsidy. Mm -hmm. so, so this is why this is why we argue with an MPCL. On refineries coming back upstream, they lied. Severally, they say it will come upstream. They lied. When we that said eight, eight deadlines now, no, eight dates. They didn't, they didn't come out clean. When they say you were owing, they say they didn't owe. Later they come and say, ah, it's normal to owe. We open credit lines. We're paying small, small. Are you owing or you're not owing? Mm. It's account payable in your books. So you're owing. Mm. That's number two. Number three, subsidy. Are you paying or not? No, federal government has not been paying subsidy for like eight years. Uh, what happens is that when we import the fuel, we can't sell it to Nigerians at the port to be too high. So they'll say we should reduce the amount. When they reduce the amount, uh, they can give us the money later or they didn't give us the money. You're saying, they, what is the difference between lost and missing? You are paying a difference, whether you want to call it short for. So on refinery, on mm. debt, on subsidy, NMPC has been inconsistent in coming out with the truth. Mm. So NMPC, as you've done with Dangote Refinery, so that at the end of the day, we can make a choice whether we buy down to the refinery uh, petrol or we buy from the one you imported. And let's be clear. So that's the argument. We can't be using subsidized petrol, allegedly, as against deregulated petrol produced in Nigeria. Mm. So that is my I, take I, this morning. And you know, Jeffrey, um, be, be, besides all of that and beyond that, it is curious that Dangote refinery is unable uh, amid this price war to come out and say categorically that this is how much we're buying petrol because it's a deregulated market and Dangote is a private business. Buying petrol or crude? Buying petrol, you know, how much it is selling petrol. Oh, how much it is selling, selling petrol, petrol right. uh, rather. So uh, we demand an explanation yet again from Dangote Refinery. Are yeah. they competing partners because potentially NNPCL is also going to come out with the uh, uh, Port Harcourt refinery, although some people have said that is jinxed because of the many missed deadlines. They are not, the uh, Port Harcourt refinery is not going to come upstream. But if it is going to come upstream and NNPCL and Dangote refinery are going to be potentially competing partners, is that why Nigerians are having to pay through their nose for petrol at this point in time? And then there is also that a need for Nigerians to be able to uh, afford petrol. There's the affordability component of this energy security. It's not just about accessibility. Mm. If not, the administration has failed on its promise, you know, to deliver the dividends of democracy to Nigerians. So we're also uh, demanding an, ex an explanation amid all of this from Mr. President himself, who doubles as the Minister of Petroleum, petroleum resources at this time. It's really uh, unfair. Mm. You know, it's just dismissed for Nigerians to, after waiting many years for Dangote refinery to come on stream to buy petrol at nearly 1,000 naira per liter. This is probably wrong timing, but I bought it for 800 naira. <laughs>
You bought subsidized fuel. I did. Let's contextualize it, yes. I think we've all been buying subsidized yeah, fuel. Whether so you're buying it for 1,000 plus or 800. Because some... landing cost is 1,100. Well, go. we have a lot to talk about. So that's going to be, uh, the economists will be joining us to break it down for us. Mm -hmm. they, they, are, uh, they are better at these numbers. They'll help us uh, make sense of the gray areas we are still trying to understand. But mm -hmm. we're here to defend the Nigerian people. And we were never, we're, gonna, we're not going to take anybody who is trying to not be truthful to Nigerians until they have an explanation. But let's tell you exactly what we're doing today. In a few days, residents of Edo State in the 18 local government areas will decide who succeeds Governor Gordon Obaseki amongst the about 16 contestants and candidates who won the top job. However, early signals are quite disturbing uh, with concerns about possible violence and voter apathy. We dig deep on the issues this morning. Uh, besides that, uh, we return yet again to the issue of the economy as uh, Nigeria's headline and food inflation has further eased in two consecutive months with inflation now at 32.15% while food inflation stands at 37.52%. How is this reflecting in our everyday reality, particularly amid the tough economic environment? We'll find perspective this morning absolutely so you can be a part of the show all of his topics are for the taking not just for the taking for the contributing for the questioning for the probing mm -hmm. hashtag ctv morning brief just right there on your screen head over to social media x and if you're on youtube as well you could drop your comments one or two cents about the pricing of petrol the back and forth the mm -hmm. ping ponging about the economy latest inflation figures are you feeling it and of course the coming edo elections it's a lot but you can be a part of the show so you ready we'll take a top stories bring you some of the stories we've been tracking the last 24 hours after that we'll get to what you've been talking about on x and then join us as we start the big conversations for today. Join us again. Top on the brief this morning is a presidential visit to Meidugri, the Brown State Capital, to sympathize with the government and victims of flood that ravaged the metropolis and adjoining local government areas. President Bolatinbu visited one of the internally displaced persons camp where he assures them that the federal government will provide them with support as they will not be left alone, including that uh, fund for disaster management. It was accompanied by the pre president was accompanied by the president of the Senate, Goswil Akbabio, Mr. Minister of Agriculture, Abubakar Kiari, and other aides after being received at the Maiduguri Air Force Base by the IGP, governors of Kwara, Sokoto, Bochi, and Kogi states. Yobe and other affected states. I say we will pull together a very good program for Nigeria to recover from this calamity and do better in the interest of our people. I've been thinking of how do we tackle this kind of a problem. Whether it's climate change or any other means. But there must be a disaster relief fund for victims. Disaster relief fund is the new one from the presidency to tackle some of these issues. We're staying in Borno State, where the senator representing Borno South local government, uh, Borno South, I should say, in the Senate, Senator Alin Dume, is appealing to the federal government to show empathy and make its presence felt in the aftermath of the May degree flood, which has affected over two million people in its estimation in May degree metropolis and parts of Jere local government area. The appeal is coming after the federal government agencies NEMA and NEDC embarked on emergency distribution of relief materials with several feeding centers uh, being created to provide meals to the displaced persons. The federal government, honestly, we have the scratch of what they are doing, but they need to intensify it to create a national, and this is a national disaster, not only uh, a, a, a state disaster. And uh, they should declare a kind of emergency in, on food and feeding. Food, feeding, uh, and um, rescue. Because up to now, so many people are trapped. I got an information that even along Baga Road, because the charge has been overflowing and it's, uh, it affected so many areas like uh, 
Marti, around around that Marti, around part of Mungunu, and part of Baga itself has also been affected. And in fact, going down to Bubio, Gomburu, some 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 localities or, or wards have been affected. So the federal government should honestly stand up to it because this is a matter of emergency. I guess that's part of the response of the president. Well, let's head to the nation's capital, where motorists have expressed mixed feelings over the accessibility of petrol in the last few days as Nigerians begin to adjust to the new price regime of PMS uh, following the agreement reached between the Dangote Refinery and the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, the NMPCL. While some have had, have had it easy uh, to access the product, others are concerned over the likelihood of another round of scarcity even though they lamented the exorbitant price of the product. Now, as part of efforts to reduce the number of out-of-school children in the country, the federal government is pledging its commitment to upgrade existing dilapidated facilities in secondary schools across the country. The Executive Secretary of the National Senior Secondary School Education Commission, Mr. Iyela Jai, will disclose this at the government house, a government science secondary school in Cotton Karafe, uh, on the outskirts of Kogi State, explains how the government is embarking on massive interventions uh, to transform the secondary education subsector in order to provide a conducive learning environment and atmosphere for all students. I'm sure you have heard about uh, building collapse in some certain schools in this country. We will not. We are interested in solid buildings. We are interested in buildings that will last for a very long time to come. We will not want buildings that will be constructed this year and after two or three years, five years or ten years or fifty years, and then you begin to see the problems with such buildings. We want our own buildings, NSEC school buildings, to be very, very solid and of high quality. I know that you are going to do a very good job, and I know that you are going to deliver timely and, of course, quality job. And I want to assure you that if you deliver on quality, if you deliver timely, that this will product, this will commend you for further, uh, for further job in the future. Well, the Benway State Government is targeting 15,000 enrollment of new pupils in public schools from nursery to primary classes with its free education initiative offered at the Benway North East Zonal Awareness Campaign in Vendinkaya, local government area of the state. The executive chairman of the Benway State Universal Basic Education Board, Dr. Grace Adagba, represented by the board secretary, says the Zonal Awareness Campaign held in Benway Northwest, Benway South and Benway Northeast it has witnessed increased interest from stakeholders that will ensure the enrollment uh, target of the government. Tomorrow's story is now the National Identity Management Commission has disclosed that 110 million Nigerians have now been enrolled into the National Identification Numbers, NIN. The director of the commission, Mrs. Bisoye Koka Dusote, stated this at the sixth National Identity Day celebration in Abuja, she says. Uh, the commission is working to ensure that more Nigerians are enrolled uh, within the shortest possible time. We have enrolled over 110 million Nigerians as of today. This provides a unique opportunity for the other two pillars of the DPI, data exchange and payment, to be layered on foundational identity for its effective development and adoption. I must say we are on the right path and key strides that we made through collaboration and partnerships with government agencies and private sector players linking of names and phone numbers with the telecommunication companies, name and bank verification number, harmonization with financial institutions to facilitate digital payments, digital money, digital identity and digital processes amongst others. Let's move on now to uh, other stories. The newly promoted Assistant Inspector General of Police and former IC FCT Commissioner of Police, 
Mr. Benazigwe has vowed to rid the nation's capital of criminals and ensure optimum security in the city. He said that this year in a sent for dinner organized in his honor by the minister of the FCT, Mr. Nyesom Wike. Mr. Igwe has just assumed office as the AIG in charge of Zone 7. Well, on his part, the FCT minister has urged him to continue in his service to the nation and serve with dignity. Away from that, let's move straight to what is going on in the world of business. Nigeria's headline inflation rate eased for two consecutive months. That's a great thing. Uh, from 34.19% in June to 33.40% uh, uh, 30, in July and now stands at 32.15% in the month of August. The National Bureau of Statistics' latest consumer price index report shows that the headline inflation eased by 1.27% to 32.15% in August 2024, while food inflation stood at 37.52% from 39.53% in the same month, indicating a 2.37% decrease month on month. The August 2024 headline inflation showed a decrease of 1.25 percent points when compared to the July 2024 uh, headline inflation rate. However, on a year-on-year -year basis, the headline inflation rate was 6.35 percent points higher compared to the rate recorded in August 2023, which stood at 25.80 uh, percent. On the international scene, but it has to do with our own, the Director General of the World Trade Organization, Dr. Ngozi okonjo Wala, says she will seek a second four-year term when her mandate expires in August 2025. The first woman and first African to head the WTO has taken into account what our spokesperson, Mr. Ishmael Dane, describes as overwhelming and broad-based support expressed by members. Her decision to seek another term was officially communicated to WTO Chair and Norwegian Ambassador Peter Goldberg. The WTO's African group formally requested that she makes herself available for a second term at the same meeting and proposed that the process be re pro process to renominate her should begin as soon as possible. And so far, no other candidate has indicated interest for the top job. In sports news, apparently, the tension between Anthony Joshua and Daniel Dubois is building momentum in the days leading up to their IBF heavyweight world title fight at Wembley Stadium. The fighters had to be separated when promotion got on the way, with Frank Warren finding himself in between the two giants as security guards held them back during a head-to-head -head interview. The promoter says he expects the atmosphere to remain tense over the course of the week. So we'll be looking at how that plays out uh, at Wembley when they meet in that particular bout. But well, that, those are the stories we've been tracking for you, say, in the last uh, 24 hours and earlier part of today it will form part of our conversation for the show and the rest of the day on the station but Bukolana joins me to bring you up to speed with what you have been talking about on our social media of choice which is X Bukola. Yes, indeed, Jeffrey. Hello again. And Nigerians have been talking about a myriad of issues from uh, the NNPCL's new price uh, of petrol to the president visiting Borno and then to, you know, other matters, Lagos distributing CNG conversion kits to um, transporters. But you find a mixture of um, skepticism, sarcasm in all of these comments. But let's start with um, NNPCL selling Dangote's petrol at 950 naira per litre and 1,019 naira in Borno State. Kalu, okay, Kalu is the first person speaking and he says anything Nigerians know how to adjust. They adjust again. Three increases in one year. Mm -hmm. More like seven because there were more increases in between than the track. official ones, <laughs> yes. Son, we missed it. Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> All right, Tunda Adelike says, this is understandable since NMPCL is paying down to the refinery in US dollar for September. PMS offtake, there will be downward review of the prices when Naira transaction commences. Uh, on October the 1st. Well, let's see how that plays out. Ah, well, that's the expectation. But this next one is from Artet, who says, the government can subsidize 1,300 Naira for fuel products from Malta, but charges 950 Naira for Dangote petroleum products. Why are our leaders doing this to us, Nigerians? They should also subsidize Dangote's fuel so we can buy it for 450 
or 490 naira per litre, which is a reasonable request <laughs> by every standard. Well, the, the, the economists will be here. They will speak, they'll speak on the issue. But let's go to the next one that has to do with the president visiting Boronu and uh, condoling with the government and the people that have been affected by that flood and saying there will be that disaster fund that will be uh, raised at some point to support all of this. So, uh, Bukala, you take the first one. And this one is from it's Shoshana, who says, nice, proactive, first action after arriving from his China and UK trips. More donation and relief materials should be given to Borono State. Good. Good that he'll be seeing the damage caused by the flooding with his eyes. Well, we also need to prove that money from the allow down that was supposed to be used. Uh, because if you have to do it, you have to do it holistically because we understand some monies were voted for that project. But mm. we'll talk about that maybe later. Isholek says donating money to these people is not the solution to the problem. We need a proper inspection for constructed roads and projects in this country. These people are building temporary drainage. Uh, drainage and bad roads. Kola. Mm. Uh, well, just to add to that, three billion naira per state to uh, tackle the impact of uh, the floods and other natural disasters. Mm. Well, we must look into that space as well to see how effective those funds have been spent such that this time next year we're not back again talking about another disaster. Well, this next one is from Manik who says, I think you should also find a lasting solution to the issues. This practice of not fixing things in the state just because you're looking for donations should stop. Let's talk about that inflation that has slowed consecutively. Mm -hmm. uh, it was all, all time, no, not all time, uh, record high in uh, June. And then it, it eased in July. July and it further eased in August, August uh, by about 1.2%. Uh, the MBS is attributing this to the harvest season, perhaps, because food, in, food inflation is the biggest driver. Uh, there has been an argument whether uh, it, it is as much as been reported with the numbers mm -hmm. or whether it should have been marginal ease, but those are the numbers we have. So we have to stick to the facts. Toba Shagala says, should we celebrate inflation rate of 32.15 inflation rate at uh, still means the economy is bleeding and no sign of respite soon. We're still having hyperinflation. The cosmetic approach by government to strengthen the economy won't yield result because production outside field is zero. And Ibukunolua says, I think this only happened on social media because the reality has not been felt by the masses. And, you know, true to her words or his words, depending on who, uh, the gender, because if you go to the market now, check on commodity prices, what, you know, what are Nigerians paying for beans, for plantain, for mm -hmm. rice? I, I think somebody spoke on a bag of rice well, much later on, but let's go to the next one. Anasan, yeah. it says, I believe this drop was not due to any government policies or move, but as a result of the commencement of harvesting of farm products from the northern part of the country. Mm. And Maga Dream Queen says, we're paying three times for goods today, 32% indeed, more like 300%. That's another view. Okay. That the reality of the inflation <laughs> figures is actually higher than what the NBS publishes every month. At BC, our partner said, lies, lies. But the price of commodities still goes up every day. Rice is now 92 naira as I'm speaking. Mm. Okay, Bukola, you have the next set And of... the next talking point is on the federal government commencing distribution of CNG conversion kits to transporters in Lagos. And Narrow Scope has the first one. And they say, even as the price of petroleum is on a teether to strike reasonable balance, CNG would be made to bear the effect of the irregularities of petroleum in the market and cng by the way is about 100 naira to 150 naira per liter um in nigeria uh, if they implement it and it hits uh spaces and like self 60 percent of cars use mm -hmm. cng if it is possible and then we now have options but the to question use. is do we have the okay. infrastructure you know for the manufacture transportation and sale of cng i guess the presidential in people are in charge of this initiative will be able to respond but those are the that's, that's as much as we can take this morning, but keep it coming. Uh, we'll accommodate as much as we can. This is your show. This segment is dedicated to you, uh, to have you amplify your voice on the show because it's a community show. But hey, we'll get straight to our very first conversation for the day. We're talking about a couple of things. A do election, uh, the inflation and the state of the economy and the dangle, say, NMPCL, all of it together. But when we come back after this break, we'll bring you our very first. Join us again.
Well, elections, they say, have consequences. And we see it all around at the federal, state, and even local government levels. And this morning, uh, we're turning our attention to the coming election in Edo State. It's a big one, and it's an election that will have a ripple effect across board because all the major parties are vying uh, for a position in that state. That's the number one seat of governor. Well, we have joining us on the show this morning. Just before we get into all of that field matter, let's turn our attention to this all-important conversation that touches at the heart of democracy. Samson Itoto, the executive director of Yaga Africa, is our guest as we walk through the coming Edo elections. Good morning, Mr. Itoto. You're welcome to the Morning Brief. A very good morning to you all, and thanks for having me. Well, I, I know that uh, the petrol, what I say prices, will have some sort of effect on this coming election in Edo State in terms of transport costs, uh, whether or not people want to travel all the way back uh, to vote in that election, seeing prices, uh, particularly for Edo State, will be 900 plus. So I, I don't know if that is something that we're factoring into all of this conversation, but I just want to get your insight into, uh, first, how you view this coming election in terms of uh, the rhetorics that have come up, uh, the violence, you know, whether or not ideas are contending and all of that. Just your preliminary thoughts. And you can put in the petrol issue. Do you think it will be a, a major drawback for this election? Well, once again, good morning. Of course, the petrol issue will be uh, a defining factor in this election. Um, Yaga Africa has released um, three pre-election observation reports. And in those reports, we did highlight the fact that economic hardship and the scarcity or the challenge of accessing and procuring fuel will be a fundamental problem. Um, what the politicians in Edo have been doing in the last couple of weeks is to use, you know, this, to exploit the situation to entice voters. And we've seen where free petrol have been declared, you know, for um, the voters in, in Edo. And in the last two months, um, there are dedicated petrol stations where politicians have procured, you know, fuel and have asked um, voters you know, to go to those, and their supporters, to go to those polling, to those fuel stations to access fuel. But that also has logistical implications as well, because as you heard from INEC, that the transport workers have also increased, you know, the cost of their services as a result of this fuel scarcity. And if INEC is unable, you know, to meet those demands, even though we understand that they've reached an agreement, uh, there will be logistical challenge on the day of election, because what you would find is that those transport workers will, will, will refuse, you know, to provide their cars for deploying electoral material. So I don't think we're out of the woods yet. It's important that we call on the road transport workers that, yes, we understand this is an economic challenge, that everyone is affected, but that the election is very important and they should, you know, uphold the commitments that they have made to, de to providing their vehicles to help INEC deploy those materials um, in all the local governments so elections can commence early on, on Saturday. But just moving away from the fuel issue, there are about six defining issues, what we call defining issues for this election. It is clear that the politicians are not preparing for elections this weekend. They are preparing for a showdown uh, because this election, sadly, it's not a competition of ideas and issues. It is more a clash of political heavyweights. And in all the conversations, the interest of the people of Edo State, you know, has not been the topmost priority. Of course, zoning is also another critical issue and how power is shared between the central zone, the northern zone, as well as the southern um, zone. The other big issue that we see is this strong arm tactics and the use of violence. In the Aga Africa's pre-election observation report, we did highlight some of the pre-election violence, you know, that we, re that we observed in some of the local governments. And in a short while, you know, we'll look at, you know, what are those flashpoints and those hotspots um, for violence. Of course, INEC integrity, you know, and competence is also another big issue for this election. And the way INEC manages this election will define its outcome. 
money politics is a bigger issue, but also pre and post um, election litigation. We've seen in the build up to this election, there have been allegations, there have been litigations yeah, as a result of Mr. acrimonious Tudor. party primaries. Those pre election issues are still there. Mr. Itodo, before you exhaust all of those issues, let's begin to take them one by one. And speaking of which, one of the big tests for this election, according to your document, may well be um, the integrity of security agencies. And that is a sticking point, particularly with the allegations leveled by the PDP in the state that some members, leaders of its party, who will form a big factor in the on election day, have been arrested. And on the other hand, we saw uh, months ahead of today, uh, the murder of that uh, you know, police officer that is yet to be investigated. Perhaps if it's being investigated, the police hasn't come out you know, to tell us exactly what happened. So what should the police be doing at this point in time to demonstrate its impartiality, um, particularly on election day? Well, if you look at the next slide, from Yaiga Africa's perspective, there are three big tests that underpin the Saturday elections. And let me start with the, the, the second one, which is the impartiality test, because Bukola, you raised the question about the police. I think that the police will be tested, especially our security agencies, will be tested on Saturday. And the big question is whether our security agencies will maintain neutrality and impartiality in the management of election security operations. Um, because there are concerns about whether you call it federal influence or federal might to influence the outcome of the election. These are based on allegations from political actors. There are also concerns that there is no level playing field um, because the security agencies have gone um, and arrested you know, um, political actors. Uh, these are concerns and what the police needs to do. And I'm excited to hear that the IG you know, has repeatedly said that they will be impartial, they will be professional. We ha we're going to hold him to his words and expect that on Saturday, that they will, or prior to Saturday, there won't be, you know, um, sort of arbitrary arrest and detention of political actors from any divide. That on Saturday, there will not be protection for talks, you know, of any p political party who will be deployed to the, to, um, to the polling stations to disrupt elections. These are big issues that we feel that it's important that we actually consider. Now, the police have said, you know, that vigilantes um, and state security outfits are not part of the election um, security architecture. Um, this is not new. This is the conventional practice in previous elections in other states. Um, vigilante groups, state-sponsored security outfits are not part of the election security architecture, also based on the provisions of the Electoral Act. So it is absolutely nothing new with this pronouncement. I think the police is just reminding us of the policy and the provisions of the law. So we expect them, um, you know, to act professionally and impartially and to address the concerns political stakeholders have made because they will be undergoing an impartiality test on Saturday. The second big test is the resilience test. And this is actually on the part of the voters. Because voters, you know, need to show up on Saturday to vote for candidates of their choice. If you look at the data, the turnout, voter turnout for Edo governorship elections have declined. In 2016, it was 32%. In 2020, it came down 20 something percent, and now we don't know what the um, turnout will be because it came out about 27 percent. And so there was an eight percent decline from 2016 to 2017 in the 2020. In the light, you know, of this sort of early warning signs of violence, in the light of this adverse weather condition like rainfall, we hope that the voters will defy all odds, show up to cast their votes, and not be scared, you know, about some of this violent rhetoric. The last biggest test is the integrity test. And there are four fundamental questions, and this relates to INEC. And the first critical one with respect to you know, the integrity test that INEC will undergo is one that will all the sensitive materials, ballot papers and result sheets, and even non-sensitive materials, 
will they be deployed promptly to all the local governments in the state so voting can commence promptly? That will determine, you know, whether the election meets the integrity test. The other one is whether INEC will maintain consistency, you know, in enforcing and implementing the rule on suspending election in cases where there is substantial disruption of election, because Section 24 of the Electoral Act is very clear. And so if you have early warning signs of violence, if it appears that politicians are preparing for a showdown, they might instrumentalize violence to undermine the elections. So how is INEC right. going to apply, you know, the rule on suspending elections where there is substantial disruption is critical. The third sort of test is whether INEC will instrumentalize its power, you know, to do what? To review declarations and returns made under duress or in contravention of the electoral law. Because INEC has the power to review results. We expect that in the light of this election uh, warning signs, that you will see situations where um, officials will be forced to, to announce results. But INEC will need to do what? To enforce its own power by reviewing those declarations. All right, Mr. Zodo, let's, let's talk about some of the things you said. Uh, part of your release that talked about flashpoints and hot spots and what you would expect to happen. We, I can see that it's quite dominant in places like Edo South, where we have Ovia North, Ovia South, Ego Oredo, uh, as well as in the north, where we have um, Esako. Uh, east and west, and even uh, in S, S and south, and all of this. Um, given the fact that these are possible flashpoints, and from what you've seen and what you've observed, there will be fireworks, most likely. What should we be using as metrics to measure how the security agencies will be able or have been able to do their job? Because this looks like, okay, we know what is coming. We should be prepared for what is coming, not to be reactive, rather should be proactive. I know you're not a security expert, but from an observer point of view and somebody who has been involved in the election, uh, what, what are the failures you've seen when these things happen that can be corrected before it happens? I think that in the pre-election period, there's a lot that the security agencies can do. And the first is mopping the small and light arms that are you know, um, almost everywhere in the States. They, there is a proliferation of small and light arms based on our observation reports. And we expect that the police can mop up, you know, all these arms. They know these actors. They know where these arms are. And even if they don't, this is where intelligence actually comes in. But it's also not just the police, but the other security agencies, ensuring that they mop up all the small and light arms that are in the custody of thugs and cultists across the different divides. So let's not make any mistake that this is um, just um, about one particular political party. On the, on the major political divides, you have, you have thugs on, on, on both sides. You have um, groups you know, that are being instrumentalized for violence. So there is a need to mop up those arms. The second point is what's the level of protection you know, that will be provided for INEC officials to deploy materials in these flashpoints of violence and these local governments, you know, that we have identified based on our pre-election observation. Because we don't want a situation where on Friday, where the materials will be deployed to the local governments and to the racks, that police officers and security agencies will not accompany these materials. Because what we have seen in some states is that INEC is ready to deploy but there are no security agencies to accompany INEC deploy to those states. And if the police is deploying this large number of officials, we don't expect that INEC um, officials will be stranded um, in the, when materials are going to be deployed. The second, or the third rather, is that on the day of elections, how do you ensure that thugs don't disrupt you know, votes uh, and voting and accreditation in some of those flashpoints of violence or in the strongholds of political actors. Because what we have seen is cases where thugs are deployed to polling units, they foment violence, 
And there is no reprimand of any nature. In fact, in some cases, we've seen how, you know, there are some security agencies or perhaps uniform security agencies provide protection for these dogs. We have been told that those who do that are actually fake police officers or fake security agencies. But we don't want to see any of that also happen. But lastly, it's about the results collation process. We have seen cases where accredited observers, accredited party agents, accredited journalists are not granted access to world coalition centers, local government coalition centers. INEC has accredited you know, these stakeholders, and security agencies should not prevent them from accessing those locations. These are some of the parameters we would want to see, including the fact that every official, security official who is on election duty needs to be properly identified so that we don't have these cases of either fake police officers or fake security agencies, um, you know, who are, 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 in actual fact, dogs who are masquerading as security agencies, deploying violence to undermine the outcome of the elections. So, uh, in, in short, the, the success of this election will be decided by maybe three major people or three major places. The polling stations, that's INEC, the police station, that is the security operatives, police leading and others uh, in that sector. And at the petrol station too, because uh, people will need uh, petrol. And this will decide whether or not uh, they will come out or how they will vote. And that leads me to my next question. Uh, and this is at the heart of the election itself. Whether or not voters are, are rational in their approach to voting, uh, have you seen, because we've seen the political, uh, I mean, I mean the, the candidates and the political parties, we've seen uh, what they're clashing on, not really based on ideas or, you know, solutions in that sense. What we're seeing is a clash of personalities, throwing, you know, shades at each other, mud at each other. You know, you hear some words and you're thinking they shouldn't come out of the mouth of a politician attacking, you know, based on personalities and personal issues. So I'm concerned for the voters who are watching. Do you think they will go out there to vote rationally and say, well, I think this person would fix the challenges we have? By the way, we're in, a, we're in an existential threat situation. So we need people that can fix the problem, right? So do you think voters in Edo State will go out to vote rationally based on what they've been presented with? Or in spite of what they've been presented with, they will still vote rationally and say, well, I'm voting for this person based on the ideas they've brought to the table? Well, in the field of elections, there, there's a debate whether voters make rational choices or they make emotional choices. Uh, and I won't get into that dialectic. I think what is critical is whether the political actors, you know, are not serving the people a fate I can play as a result of how they have engaged this election. It is really sad that they, there was a debate, um, you know, hosted by one of the media organizations, um, but that the main political actors didn't show up. You know, only one of the candidates or from one of the parties that, that, that showed up. And that's disturbing. They didn't avail the people, you know, of Edo State the opportunity to debate some of their policies. And it's just been a clash of personalities. And we expect that first voters will show up. And, you know, at Tiaga Africa and the whole of the civil society community, we're calling on the voters in Edo State, you know, to come out defy all odds. This is an opportunity to show resilience. Because if you don't show up, you know, to vote on Saturday, someone else is voting for you, and then you are going to, be ha you're going to have a leadership that will be determined by a minority. The turnout for last election was 27%. And some of this violent rhetoric, one of the goals it seeks to serve is to, is, is to demotivate people to show up. Because when people don't show up, Elections can be rigged and they can be stolen easily. So part of me, Mr. Toto, you know, to, should show up. Uh, part of me, part of me to come in here. And when you show up, uh, forgive when me. You show forgive up, me to butt in quickly. Uh, I, I wanted to add this point. Mm -hmm. uh, something played out recently, and it's about this, uh, you know, debate thing. There was meant to be a debate in a certain part of the country, right? And you know, some people started spreading news that rather than spend money to organize a debate. They should give them the money instead so they can feed themselves. And you know, 
this became a thing and it was almost going to turn violent. Like if you hold this debate, we're going to scatter it. Why spend money doing a debate when you can give us the money to get food? So it also speaks to the thinking, the rationality or emotionality of the voters themselves, of people, whether or not ah, they see the big picture. But you can land on that point you're making. I just wanted to put that in. I, I totally agree with you that people are hungry. People are dissatisfied with how um, political leadership have managed their affairs. They do not appreciate or understand why having voted for political leaders, their social conditions have not improved. So I can understand. But are we interested in short-term, mid-term, or long-term gains? And this is why people need to show up. And despite the fact that the politicians have denied the people the opportunity to debate and share some of their plans, I think that voters should still look at, you know, the actors and the candidates and just try, you know, to determine who has your interest um, at heart. A lot of people are going to be voting based on the zoning arrangement. They're going to be voting based on personalities. But personalities don't put food on your table. Personalities don't provide you security. Personalities don't, uh, don't address long-term issues that have, that have deprived you of political and economic opportunity. You, the voters should go out on Saturday, you know, and make choices that are based on their conviction that a political party or a candidate has what it takes to solve the problems that they face in the state and not just look at sentiments or emotions um, to influence the way they cast their vote. These politicians, with all the brickbats that we've seen, they have their way of settling their scores. You'll be very shocked that right after the elections, you will see them drinking, eating together. So there is no need for you to step into this inter-elite conflict that we see in Edo State. But look at, as voters, who has the capacity, who has the competence, who has the character mm. to deliver on some of the promises that they have made in the long term. And one who also you know, listens to the people. I think it is very, very important because the people in Edo State are looking for a transformative and accountable and a responsive leadership. Mm. And, and, you know, regardless of the motivation of the voters in this election, um, you, your earlier uh, commentary uh, pretty much supports the point that um, election is a multi-stakeholder engagement and the success anchors on um, the police, the polit politicians, and indeed INEC itself. But if we took the conduct of the politicians into consideration, Mr. Itodo, this morning, which, you know, uh, forms at least two of the high points in the issues that you raised in your document. Uh, you talked about a clash of political heavyweights, money politics and strong arm um, tactics and violence. If these factors will determine uh, the conduct on Saturday, should we take it for granted that after Saturday, the politicians will be headed to court and the election may not be decided, uh, at least definitely, des definitively on Saturday? <laughs> That's a very interesting question, Bukala, uh, because one of the slides speaks to some of the issues that we said, they are, they are the big issues to note. It is clear that the stage has been set for post-election <laughs> litigation. If in the pre-election litigation, you have close to 10 um, pre-election cases from political parties, um, as you can see, prior to um, last week, there were only 17 parties on the ballot. But a, one of the parties that failed, that failed to meet the deadline for submission of candidates, went to the courts and procured you know, a judgment um, an order of court, and so the, the, the party have been added to the ballot by virtue uh, of, um, of, of court order. We've also seen um, several litigations challenging the outcomes of the primaries, uh, and so we expect that, you know, in the post-election period, there will be post-election litigation for three reasons. The first one, this is a highly competitive, highly competitive election. And in a highly competitive election, the margin of lead may not be as wide as, as we might think. We don't 
perhaps expect a landslide victory, so highly competitive. Secondly, is a clash of political heavyweights. Those factors actually matter because what you're going to see is an appropriation of strong arm tactics and violence to influence the outcome of the election because every political actor on all the divide is deploying different tactics to undermine each other and see if they secure electoral victory. The third one is that there is pressure you know, even on the Electoral Commission, you know, to deliver um, <laughs> a credible election. Because if it doesn't, it becomes a recipe for violence. But then people are going to question, you know, the outcome of the election. And that's why in one of the slides we have draw we're drawing people's attention to the following. The first one is overvoting. That based on the law, based on the decision of the Supreme Court, you need three documents that must be tendered to prove over voting. The first one is the voter's register. The second one is the BVAS machine. And the third one is the form EC8A, the result sheet at the polling unit. Voters need to be conscious of this, that where there is over voting, like we have seen you know, in previous election, these three documents are critical to prove over voting. So don't allow talks take away the BVAS machines. Because when they destroy the BVAS machines or steal them, even though it's a national asset, it will be difficult to prove over voting. Also, the result sheets are very sensitive. So you need to keep an eye on the result sheets so that they are not stolen or destroyed. The second issue to note is that collation of results, as far as the Nigerian electoral system is concerned, is manual. Collation of results is manual, that the IREV is not part of the collation system based on the decisions of the Supreme Court. That's the current state of the law. But IREV is for public viewing purposes. That even though it's for public viewing purposes, it's not part of the collation system, you still need to keep an eye on the IREV, download the results, and use that to compare the manual process. The third one, which is also very critical, is how a winner will be determined on Saturday. There are two conditions that a candidate must meet to be declared a winner. The first one is that they must score majority of lawful votes. And secondly, they must score, you know, 25% in two thirds of the 18 local governments of the state. Therefore, you, a candidate must secure 25% in 12 local governments because 12 represent two thirds of the state. In other words, if a candidate secures majority of votes in 12 local governments, they will be declared winner. And lastly is the margin of lead principle. Bukola, you raised a very critical point. And this is where there are concerns. How will the margin of lead principle be applied? And what it means is that if in a competitive race of this nature, where there is no landslide victory, if the margin of lead between the top two candidates is less than the total number of voters who collected their PVCs in polling units where elections were either postponed, elections did not hold, or elections were canceled, the election will not be conclusive. It will be declared inconclusive. And the rationale is that if the voters who collected their PVCs in polling units where elections were canceled, where elections were postponed, or elections did not hold, if they vote, it will affect the overall outcome. And we pray we don't get into that situation, that the election is concluded you know, on first ballot, um, but then it's going to take the cooperation of all stakeholders. All right. And in an election of this nature, where early warning signs already show you know, possibilities of violence, political actors can actually exploit this situation. This is where INEC needs to demonstrate consistency in <clears throat> the application of the margin of lead principle. All right. Mr. Etodo, so let, let's dig further with a profound sense of respect to the candidates themselves. But this is clearly a battle of ego between Governor Godwin Obasaki and Senator Adams Oshomole. The last time Adams Oshomole was able to secure and influence uh, people or the process by mean, I mean, supporting a candidate to emerge as a governor was of, of Governor Obasaki's first coming. On the flip side, this is the first time the uh, political prowess of Godwin Obaseki will be tested because in 2016 he was supported by uh, Adam Sushomale. In 2020, uh, 2020 yeah, he was supported by Governor Yes on Wiki and uh, others within that rank. So now 
this is the first time he will be tested politically, whether he has stature or not. So that's why I say it's a battle of ego. One did it four, eight years ago. He's trying to make recovery. This one is trying to make a map. So we have a very serious case in our hand. But I want, based on this background, I want to zoom in on the INEC officials. What do you think the INEC official can do? Because we've seen a scenario where either gone pointed to their head or their life threatened and they are forced to write result. Well, if that happens and the man or woman is forced to write a result and he goes to INEC to say, I was forced, is, will it be a word against his word against whoever is accusing him of, no, that's not what happened? How does this play out? Because we have to look at all the scenarios if we want to have a proper election, even if it's not going to be perfect. Well, at Yaga Africa, we've built all these scenarios, especially around the law and INEX guidelines. And I would say this, you know, that the success of Saturday's election it will be contingent on the personal integrity of the INEC officials and the security agencies managing this election. Now, you can put every instrument and every mechanism in place if the individuals who are the polling units managing the elections, if the individuals who are deployed to manage election security, if they do not have, you know, regard for integrity, transparency and accountability, there's absolutely nothing you can do. So the personal integrity of those people is critical. Now, integrity is not written on the face. INEC has recruited polling officials. It's trained those officials. But we know, based on practice and experience, that politicians compromise election officials. In the recent elections in, in Kogi State, where you, know, you saw core members who were arrested you know, um, with several funds, and they were you know, responsible for um, pre-filling result sheets. Those are cases where they were compromised by polling officials. And so but INEC needs to introduce mechanisms that checkmates the excesses of its staff. And this is where the decision taken by the Electoral Commission on the day of election is very critical. So let's start. Three, one. Now, we have cases where uh, officials have been trained, especially coalition officials, um, have been trained and supervisors. And then there is last minute or 11th hour substitution of those um, officials without any explanation. So we need to keep an eye on the electoral officers in the 18 local governments of uh, those states. And I know and I'm aware that the INEC leadership understands the implications of this and they are available to take any action where there is a report filed. This is where media organizations and civil society need to, you know, be on top of their game. And if there are questions, you know, accountability questions, and they observe anything untoward, they should report to the INEC leadership in Abuja to take action at the state. The second, is when a pol polling official, um, you know, do what, um, reports that they've been forced to declare results. The key question is what's INEC's remedial action? The law empowers INEC. And, and so for the INEC leadership, the collation officers are important. Who are those who will be collating the results at the world level? If those people are compromised, Geoffrey, jo jo they would accept that result and tabulate it. Because you ask yourself, how come you know, there are cases where there is overvoting, where elections are canceled, but you see coalition officers admit the results and collate them? But it's about what INEX monitoring mechanism is. If these reports come, INEX should take action and not allow the returning officer make a declaration before they take remedial action. So let's wind down on these two points. Uh, one is the role of IREF. Uh, we said that IREF will be used for just public viewing and not uh, for collation, uh, whether or not that can be an issue uh, on the one hand. But the bigger one is uh, PDP's call uh, for the REC to be redeployed uh, over family ties with the FCT minister, whom said, well, yes, but nobody can change. Even the INEC chairman, he says, cannot sway uh, the REC and INEC has come out to say well the, the election is not decided by the REC but by the voters but we know how much power officials wield and you mentioned even ad hoc core members and all of those people they wield powers not to talk of the REC we saw what happened uh, I think it was in Adamawa state and uh, how that played out eventually but anyway, we've not gotten closure to that uh, yet so uh, I'd like you to speak to that do you, do you think that's feasible uh, do you think that would also 
attained uh, that process and the eventual outcome? I think it's, a, it's public knowledge that there have been concerns expressed you know, by um, the, the current REC um, of Edo State as a result of affinity with um, um, one of the ministers um, of, the, of the Federation. That, that's not in doubt. Um, the minister has also confirmed it um, right here in channels um, when he granted an interview on one of your shows. Um, I, I think that the REC will not be moved. Um, the concerns have been noted. But what I expect, you know, from INEC is the monitoring mechanism that is in place, you know, to address some of the concerns, legitimate concerns that have been expressed. I don't agree that, um, you know, there's, the direct cannot um, undermine the election. He can. There are several powers that he has. They've been donated to him by the Electoral Commission. But I want us to give the REC the benefit of doubt, um, you know, for Saturday. Um, and we have to keep an eye you know, on all the officials, not just the REC, but all the officials deployed, and see, you know, whether they will meet this integrity test. And this is where vigilance actually comes in. Party agents should be trained in such a way that they can detect any element of fraud in the course of this entire process. If the process is not transparent, rest assured that there are civil society organizations that will, you know, detect and, 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 and release our information. For us at Yaga Africa, we are deploying the parallel vote tabulation for this election. And that's a standard methodology that can detect fraud. If the results are manipulated in any way, we will expose it, as we have done in previous elections. And if they are not, we would also tell the Nigerian people because of this standard methodology that we employ. And so, INEC has a role in the decision that it makes if it's consistent with its decision, if it, if it implements its guidelines strictly and also provisions of the law, if the coalition process is transparent, if ward and local government coalition officers are people of impeccable character and those the people don't undermine the process, then we can say that there's a substantial compliance with the rules, but currently there's a shadow of doubt that has been cast on the election. There's a crisis of confidence on INEC. And INEC, you know, can restore public confidence in the way that it managed this, this election. But I don't think that the REC, you know, will be moved. He will man the election. There are supervisory national commissioners who right. are also deployed, you know, to Edo. There are also other resident electoral commissioners. So I think there's a lot that is in place to keep him in check. But like Frederick Douglass say, the prize for liberty is eternal vigilance. vigilance. So I call on the political actors to keep an eye on all the institutions, not just INEC, but the security agencies, as well as the other political actors as well. Well, as I said, we've not gotten closure to the Adamawa situation. Uh, that former rec, uh, Hudu Yunusa Ari, last we heard was warrant of arrest issued. But, I mean, see how slow justice is grinding. But we we'll have to thank you so much. Uh, all eyes on Edo State. Uh, this weekend and will definitely be giving Nigerians full value for that election. Samson Itoto, Executive Director at Yaga Africa, thank you for your time and your work. Wish you the very best. Thank you very much. We'll take a moment now. When we return, the big topic is on the table. The back and forth between Dangote and the NMPCL, the price of petrol. What should we do, particularly now that inflation figures have come out and it looks like inflation is slowing down? Is that your reality? We'll find out in a moment, so stay with us. So now we turn our attention to the economy. Of course, we get that report that headline inflation has slowed by 1.25% to 32.12% for the month of August. But how consistent is that with the reality of your pocket? And then again, um, the pump price of petrol, uh, according to uh, the NNPCL, following the offtake from Dangote, is now 950 naira. What does that mean subsequently for inflation in the coming months? Let's have that conversation together this morning as we have joining us here in our Lagos studio, Dr. Muda Yusuf is the MD. CPPE, Center for Public Enterprises, here in Lagos. Uh, Dr. Yusuf, good morning and welcome on to the program. And we thank also have joining us, thank you, sir, from our Abuja studio, Mr. Ayobami Oyalowo, a development 
economist who joined us from, joins us from our Abuja studio. Good morning and welcome, Mr. Oyalowo. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Okay, so Dr. Yusuf, I'm going to start with you here in the studio. Um, according to uh, expert opinions, they say that um, the current inflation does not take into reality uh, the new pump price of petrol. And so as a result, um, inflation subsequently may increase uh, following the release by the MBS for the month of September. That on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, some say that, um, you know, the figures released by the NBS, you know, leave a question, a huge question mark because of what actually is the reality out there in terms of commodity. How do you weigh in on this price of commodities, rather? Well, thank you very much. I'm actually representing the Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprise. Enterprises. Yeah. Well, uh, the inflation situation is a very worrisome trend. Uh, but let me say up front that when we talk about a reduction in inflation, it does not necessarily imply a reduction in price. What it does imply is a reduction in the rate of increase in price. So if, for instance, uh, the price regime increased by, say, maybe two naira, you know, last month, and this month it increased by one naira, then you see that there has been a reduction in inflation. Meanwhile, the real price has gone up by one naira. So I think that understanding uh, needs to be need to be very to be made clear. The second point is that if you look at the inflation situation in terms of general price level, the reality is that we have seen some drop in some prices. You know, even though generally prices are still very high. For instance, if you take things like uh, food items that are related in a way to you know seasonality of production like yam, like uh, tomato, pepper, and all of that, you see that there has been some reduction in those prices. But generally, those items that are anchored, and quite, we have quite a large number of them, that are anchored on foreign exchange, that are foreign exchange dependent or import dependent, those prices are still high. And some of them are still going up higher. So that is, that is the challenge that we face. So when people say that, the figures are not reflecting the reality. That is what they are saying. Because they feel that when we say that inflation is dropping, what they expect to see is a reduction in price. Mm. But that is not what it means. And what we desire generally, and as an economy, is for prices to come down, which in economic terms is even regarded as disinflation, that when prices are actually dropping. Because uh, admittedly, the citizens are already overstretched in terms of their pockets, in terms of the pressure coming from all sides, and the new development now around the petrol price is going to further compound the situation. Mm. Because the figures we are discussing now is the August figure. So the reality of the moment is going to reflect in the September numbers. So that is, that is the way it is, but it is a very difficult and challenging situation. Yeah. Let, let me come to you now, Mr. Yalowo. I wonder if you agree with Dr. Yusuf. And just to add to that, uh, some are saying that it's really nothing to celebrate, particularly uh, because of the harvest season that has caused uh, the reduction in price that Nigerians are witnessing in the price of food. But how significant really is the harvest that uh, has caused this reduction in price? How significant is it? to move the needle subsequently in inflation figures in the coming months? Uh, good morning again. Thank you for bringing me on. And um, I completely agree with Dr. Moda there on his explanation on inflation. Yeah, prices may not reflect what people want to see because uh, some things that were spiraling had reduced in the number of uh, percentages that we have seen. And like you rightly said, which I also agree with, I, I'm sure sometimes back right on this program, I predicted that uh, food inflation may slow down when the harvest uh, starts coming in, which is what we have seen in terms of uh, normal food that is seasonal, yam, potatoes, uh, tomatoes, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, the, the other things that are anchored on uh, importation and uh, 
foreign currency, like you rightly said, are not slowing down. Unfortunately, it might even get worse in September, and the reason is not far-fetched. The current fuel price was moved from 617 by the NMPC to 897, and now within a few days it is now 950 or thereabouts. So it will generally move up the price of inflation, I mean the, the rate of inflation by September. But something nobody is looking at is, uh, I, I don't think uh, uh, the price of, uh, of fuel, like everyone has been looking at, is, uh, is, is a major problem. What I mean is the uh, price of fuel hasn't gone up. What is not improving and what is causing most of this problem is the rate at which our dollar, I mean, our Naira is priced against the dollar. Uh, all the argument, I sat down yesterday to look at it. Clearly, we are still buying fuel at less than 60 cents. So what we are witnessing in that area, like you have uh, highlighted, is not price, price of fuel increment. It's price, uh, the rate of our Naira being so undervalued or so devalued. So for as long as nobody is looking at how to uh, show up the value of the Naira, fair price is going to go up, and as fair price goes up, it will impact on the prices of goods and services. Mm -hmm. So we'll come back next month, and things are likely going to get worse because uh, uh, this figure for September has will be will, will uh, the inflation figure for September will uh, factor in the current uh, uh, price of petroleum, and when that is done. We will come back here and discuss it, and we will see that uh, uh, <coughs> some other things have gone up, while uh, the food that we think uh, has been uh, a, 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 that has been a bit positive may not be that positive come September. Mr. Ayala, like you took the words out of my mouth, and I'm going to stay with you if I come to uh, Mr. Uh, Yusuf on this particular one. I, I wanted to ask you because I know that some months ago, you were quite intense with this issue of FX rate, and you spoke clearly about the approach not working. And you made your proposition, and we saw a few things that happened. What do you think is going on? Because it feels like um, the Naira has found its level, according to the expert, I mean the CBN now. And they are saying, some people are saying, Naira is grossly undervalued. This is not the true reflection of the Naira. Some are saying it is the true reflection of the Naira. And there was a time we saw that aggressive move by the monetary authority to see how, whether they were defending from the back channel or directly or the otherwise. But it looks like the government is a bit, permit me to say, comfortable with where the Naira is sitting at the moderation point of 151617. And that is biting hard and is at the heart of this conversation of all the prices we're talking about at the end of the day. So what in terms of policy aggressively should we be looking at? Because if those numbers stay the way they are and continuously, what we're saying is the price of petrol today may be a joke. So let's tackle the problem. I'll, I'll, t I'll ask you that question and then uh, Mr. Isu will also respond. Mr. Ayalo. Uh, for me, I don't know what else I can tell them. I've told them what I think they should do. They did some, they didn't do the rest. Uh, most, of, most people will not tell you the truth because you see, we're running a system where everybody is friend to everybody. What did I mean? What did I mean by that? I I remember I said um, the banks are at the heart of these uh, forex problems, and um, if you look at it, most of the bankers are friends to the people who will make decisions, so they won't fight themselves. It, it's the it, it's it's a problem we we have to live with for now. I, I don't know honestly what we can do. Uh, some banks have declared the half year figures, and it's very funny. You see them declaring trillion in, in profitability. And then you look at the economy and you ask yourself, what is going on here? I said it here. I said the banks are at the heart of our forex problem. And I was very, very unequivocal when I said those years when I was in the bank, banks generally handle all FX challenges. Today, the banks have a, a second, I mean, they have a seconded their interest to, to whatever we call BDC. And today, BDCs now determine the price of a naira to a dollar. So if you, if you want me to sit here and tell you the policy that will be, that will be pursued, I'll be lying to you. Because the, the guys who, 
were MDs before, Sanusi decided to remove them because he knew that when they stay too long in office, they become a problem. But what did they do? They use the back channel, they go and create what they call a, a group, of, a group of companies. So they go back through the back channel and become chairman of the group of the company. And then they put some weak guys as MDs who can make decisions. And then these guys are back through the back door because they can't leave the bank. In the past, you, you have that, uh, you have banks with directors, with a board that can take decisions today. The banks are run by one-man show. The board are just there to decide and pretend that they are, they are doing something while they, do, while they are really doing nothing. So the banks are the heart of these forex challenges. And if the government does not want to deal with them, what can I do? I'm just one poor guy who nobody listens to. But one day when Nigerians are ready to fix their problem, they will fix their problem. For, but for now, there is really nothing we can do. These guys are going to decide what they want to do. That is why banks can boldly declare one trillion profit in half year when they have really done nothing in terms of the risk sector. So this is a challenge. We don't produce anything, but banks are develop, I mean, are, uh, announcing huge profitability in just six months. That is a problem for Nigeria. Uh, Mr. Mr. Yusuf, uh, he, talked, he, he said if we go after the bankers, <laughs> maybe things will change. I know that the EFCC chairman has also mentioned that uh, we're coming for you guys. Well, uh, first of all, let me talk about this fuel price and the implication for transport cost. Now, we need to emphasize this point, that the social cost of these current policies is extremely very high. And the citizens are not finding it funny at all. Because, you know, we are in an economy where the social safety net is extremely very, very weak unlike what you have in some other economies, where you have heavy government presence in public transportation, where you have heavy subsidy in food, where you have subsidy in education and in health, where you have unemployment benefits. We don't have that kind of social safety net here. That is why we need to be extremely careful at the pace at which we drive some of these policies. I've had NMPC officials talking about the uh, Petroleum Industry Act, free market, market forces, and all of that. I mean, the economy is about human beings. And we need to recognize that. Because we are driving the citizens almost to the limit. You need to go, to, you need to move around the city. You need to look at faces of people at the bus stops. Some guys can't go home from the office. They sleep somewhere around the office because they cannot afford the cost of transportation. And because there is no government presence, serious government presence in public transportation, it makes it extremely difficult. So the ordinary citizens are very, very vulnerable to this increase in price. So something has to happen. We cannot walk away so quickly from this problem of subsidy. Otherwise, you make life extremely difficult for. In fact, things are already very difficult. Because up, 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 up until now, I think the NMPC was subsidizing. Although progressively, the level of subsidy is being reduced, which is fine. But to talk of complete deregulation of the whole system in an economy where we don't have a social safety net will not, will not be appropriate at all. I think I need to stress that point. Now, coming to the issue of Forex. Now, exchange rate is a price. And every price is driven by variables on the supply side and on the demand side. If you have challenges on the supply side, the exchange rate will depreciate. If you have too much pressure on the demand side, the exchange rate will depreciate. So the way to deal with this issue on the demand side is to reduce the pressure of demand for imported items through what we, what we call import substitution. And a major first step in this import substitution is what is happening with the Dangote refinery. About 35% or close to 40% of our import bill is coming from importation of petroleum products. If we're able to move that pressure away, it will have a significant impact on the exchange rate. 
if we're able to get some of our manufacturing, because the refinery is also going to produce a lot of petrochemical raw materials, polypropylene and the rest of them, right. that are used by manufacturers. So if progressively we can look inwards and reduce the imports, we'll be making some progress. And on the supply side, we need to support the export community. We need to do a lot more with our oil output, oil theft, oil production, investment in oil and gas, solid minerals. These are things we can do to shore up the supply side of the foreign exchange equation. Mm -hmm. Then there are also money laundering issues. Because a lot of cheap money, money that people do not work for, are also out there chasing the dollar. Mm. If you talk to those in business, they will tell you how they are just in flux of all sorts of money into the system. I will continue to run an exchange rate where you are, you are taking a cue from the parallel market. It could also create problems for us because there's a lot of imperfections in the market. So we need to, we need to make haste slowly and we need to recognize the peculiarities of this environment. We need to identify the, the, the imperfections in the market mm. and determine how we can so deal with we, these issues. Should right. we even have the sorry, Kai, should we even have BDCs in the first place? We should have BDCs because, because they are relating to the retail end of the market. You cannot have everybody want to buy one thousand. You go to and um, be feeling for them. You want five hundred dollars. You go and feel, you can't be doing that. They have their role, but the issue is that we need to manage our system in a way. That we reduce corruption, we release, we reduce all these illicit funds, money laundering things that are also driving up and heating up the the, 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 the economy. It's quite a lot really to chew on. But at the heart of this, two issues, forex and petrol, and they're even tied. So I, I want us to tackle this petrol issue, and you've touched on it with the Dangote situation. But let me go to Mr. Oyalo, and then I'll come back to you. Because Dr. Yusuf has spoken about, it looks like NMPC has not been excited with Dangote. <laughs> and like one of the times you came, you talked about that. But let me ask Mr. Oyalo with this. Uh, Mr. Oyalo, there's been a back and forth between uh, DRL and NMPC Limited. The latest one is regarding the pricing uh, of petrol, 898. That's what the NMPCL says uh, they are getting it for from Dangote. Dangote had released a statement saying, well, no, we have to wait for that uh, subcom, that technical committee. What we are doing now is the one we got on dollar, right, or with dollar. Let's wait till October 1st before we begin the Naira, and then we can now say this is the price. But NMPCL came back to say, no, this is fully deregulated. Government cannot fix price. So it's been a lot of back and forth. And um, people already have an image of NMPCL. There's lack of trust. The Port Harcourt refinery has not come on stream in spite of the several deadlines that have been given, right? People have said, how about you give us a breakdown of the one you import as well? There's been a lot of issues, but I wonder for you if you see uh, this at least in a detached manner, see it for what it is, or you still see the politics being played. This government has not given the CNG kits one million over a year now since subsidy was removed. We're still talking about give 10,000 here and there when we expect that this should have been done since last year. So the transport cost is still high. But do you see the NMPC Limited approaching this the right way, or you blame Dangote Refinery Limited as some in government have done? Uh, Kayode, you have packed so much into one question. It's a breakfast uh, show, so we're having a buffet, Mr. Yalawa. But before, don't, don't, don't worry, I will answer you, don't worry. I'm, I'm up to the tax. But before I answer, I will want to answer the first question he asked uh, Dr. Dauda there, and I'm going to, before I go into your own question. Yes, we, show, we are supposed to have BDCs, like I, I said here too the other day, and I, I won't change my mouth. Yes, BDC are supposed to be there for retail transactions, small, small transactions. Somebody sent you uh, Western Union from abroad, 1,500. That is what they are supposed to be there for. And they are supposed to be heavily regulated. But what we are having right now is that the BDCs have taken over the jobs of the banks, which is my own contention. You are supposed to, if you want to do transactions that are heavy, you're supposed to go through the banks, fill your form M, or if it's, a, if it's a, a visible transaction, fill your form A. But today, the banks and the BDC have, I mean, you just look at it from the angle of uh, ATM machines, for instance, the ATM, the uh, automated teller machines. If you go there today, I can assure you none of them is working. But across the road, you see somebody is selling Naira, he says he's doing POS. The level of corruption in our system is such that 
from the top to the bottom. Everybody is trying to cheat everybody. And now I'm taking that into your question. You are talking about NMPC and CNG. I'll start from the CNG part. I was, uh, I was fortunate to listen to or read from one of my younger friends. His name is Benga. Uh, Saka is his son name. He, he went to do a small research on this CNG. And you'll be amazed at how many uh, vehicles have been converted because the federal government is making available for private, I mean, sorry, for commercial vehicles, uh, CNG for free. So, but you, you real, he realized in his small research that a lot of them have converted their vehicles to CNG. But guess what? The prices have not changed. Unfortunately, or fortunately for the, the owners of the vehicle, if, if, when he did the calculation, even if you are buying the kit by yourself, within one year, you will have saved about 1.2 million because he made the calculation so easy like this. So a lot of them have converted their, I mean, for those people doing uh, private uh, hailing cabs, cab hailing uh, businesses, most of them have converted their cars. But they are still charging uh, commuters the correct, I mean, the former price like they are doing uh, PMS. So everybody is taking advantage of everybody. Despite the fact that they have taken advantage of the free conversion of uh, from CNG, I mean, from petrol to CNG, they have not, that has not reflected in the pricing. Now, let's go to the Dangote question you asked me. That is the big elephant in the room. I have sat here, and I've said it, and I'm going to say it again. The NNPC is a danger to the society called Nigeria. They have not told us the truth forever. They've not been telling us the truth. We have spent billions of dollars on turnaround maintenance of uh, uh, what you call the, the uh, 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 national refineries. Till today, they have over, they have thousands of staff there drawing heavy salaries. They have not refined one drop of fuel. But will you, do you know that we have five modular refineries that are working? Nobody knows. So the NMPC has been opaque, has been non-transparent, and has been deceiving Nigerians and taking advantage of Nigerians till today. Now, coming to this Dangote issue, nobody is telling Nigerians the truth. Dangote will say this, NNPC will say that. that I've never seen Dangote issue so many uh, <laughs> press statements in my life since I'm an adult till, until recently. So there is something going on between NNPC and Dangote that they're not telling Nigerians. I don't want to sit on Dangote's side because, of course, he's a businessman. He wants to make profit. NNPC, on the other hand, is a national asset, but it has been nothing but national in the way they've been working. A lot needs to be told, but those who know about the oil business, maybe they can tell us better. But what I can say from where I'm sitting is that the NNPC has been a danger, has been a pain to Nigerians, and they've not been very, very transparent with Nigerians. They've told us, they've, uh, in fact, the chairman told us, I mean, is it chairman they call the, the head? That's he said by the uh, end of last month, the Portaco refinery will start refining. In fact, they went to flare gas and pretend that they were doing something. But as I speak to you, that place is refining nothing. So, and nobody is being held to account. So for as long as there is no consequences for actions, this will continue to happen. And Dr. Yusuf, Mr. Yalowa has spoke, spoken point blank. But this is where we're at now. People are looking at the price uh, from Dangote Refinery and they're saying that, what, 950, how can it be more expensive than what we've imported, even though there's the shortfall payment in all of that? But what do you see? Because you had said that it looks like NNPC Limited is not excited about Dangote. So is this your prophecy now coming to pass? <laughs> like, well, I told you. Well, uh, first of all, I think there are some powerful forces that are bent on preserving the status quo. And what I mean by the status quo is the continued importation of petroleum products. Because apparently quite a number of people are really benefiting from that. Mm. And uh, such people are not really excited about this domestic production, which is the way to go. So we need that political commitment to make it happen. Because if you really want to transform this economy, we need to move as quickly as we can, you know, to domesticate or to localize a lot of transactions and a lot of things that we consume. And the number one is these petroleum products. Now, this need to both Dangote, Refinery, and the NNPC. First, 
I'm not too comfortable about the rhetorics. These are two major institutions. One giant in the private sector, another giant in the public sector. Well, the CNMPCL is incorporated now. Yes, it, whatever <laughs> it is, it's still a big, still a big, big player, yeah. both in the economy and in that sector. So coming to the public space to exchange the kind of things we are hearing, I don't think is good mm. for the economy. It's not good for our perception. It's not good for investors' confidence. A lot of these things are things that can be, you know, can be managed within that ecosystem, mm. not coming to the open. Secondly, is that there seems to be a tendency to give a dog a bad name in order to hang it. And I'm saying this with all due respect. Now, I'm really worried about the dramatization of the price, the cost that NMPC is buying from Dangote. When did NMPC start to tell us how much they bought petroleum products? Maybe they are born again. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I mean, they have been importing for ages. How many times have they told us, this is where we bought it from, this is how much we bought it, this is this. I this mean, is why? The quality of. Uh... Yes. And you know, Dr. Yusuf. Why is it that it's when you are not buying from domestic sources? You are not giving us all sorts of statistics. So you're not giving the impression as if this current wave of price increases is it's it's because you are buying from Dangote. That is the impression that is being created. Whereas the bigger issue is that the NMPC itself and even the government is, is being almost overstretched by the pressure of subsidizing the petroleum products. That is a big issue. If you want to walk away from the subsidy, you make that announcement. You cannot tell us that what you are buying from Dangote is costlier than what you are importing in terms of landing costs. It's not possible. Uh, and you know, Dr. Yusuf, yes. giving a good, a, a good dog a bad name in order to hang it is being interpreted in so many ways. I'm going to take this to you, to Mr. Uh, Mr. Yalowo. Uh, some are saying that this pricing released by the NNPC is deliberate in order to um, make Dangote look bad. And um, when it comes on with the Port Harcourt refinery, its pricing will be lower. And then Nigerians would now uh, take preference for NNPC's product. If that is the case, I'd like you to weigh in on that. And particularly, if you disagree, why does it seem as if um, Dangote is being, you know, arm twisted into silence about uh, how much exactly it is pricing its own product in the market? Well, uh, <laughs> it's, it's very funny, like the doctor said just now, NMPC has never told Nigerians where they are bringing the fuel they brought into Nigeria from. But maybe it's from Norway, or it's from Malta, or it's from Finland. And they never told us how much they bought it there and how much they are selling. But suddenly, NMPC is telling us Dangote is selling at so and so. That is why it's going to go up. I mean, it's, it's very, I'm trying to find a very nice word so that I don't say something that I will regret saying on air, but it's terrible what NMPC is doing to Nigerians. Apparently, it is very clear now, it is glaring by all human standards that some people don't want importation of fear to stop because. Is Yoruba language, there is a word that says Arijeni no Madaru. Some people profit and they thrive in chaos. They thrive when things are bad for the country. Because clearly, <clears throat> anybody with half a brain, don't even need to be an economist, to understand that our biggest problem as a country is that we rely too much on importation. And that is why we are where we are today. Now, if we are now getting some level of relief, by local production. Why are these forces so bent on killing it? The president has done nothing since he became president than to run around the world and look for investment. And if a local investor is being treated this way, you think any foreign investment, I mean, investor want to come into an economy where he will be treated this way? So it is very glaring that some people enjoy this opaque uh, in a local language, Magu Magu plan. I mean, well, Mr. Yellow, that they have been running. Just pardon me, Mr. Yellow, quickly. 
Don't you think the president, as the minister of petroleum resources, should show some willpower here and say, you know what, what? enough no, I, is I enough. I'm going there this now. should be done right. Interrupt me. I will go there. No, no, we want to get I, the shortcut so we can hit the nail on the head. Okay, let's do the shortcut. I have said all I needed to say. I think, from my own advice, if I'm advising the president, I think it is time for him to now wear the big stick. It is clear that whatever is going on in NMPC is not, and I repeat, it is not to the benefit of Nigerians. So I think it is time they clear the audience table so that we can have some form of transparency and Nigerians can breathe some sigh of relief. For me, it's not about Dangote because I, I'm not here to speak for him. I don't even care about him. But it's about the perception of how investment and, for, and investors are treated in a system that is crying for <coughs> investment in large numbers, and you have a, a, you have one already, and we don't have anything to stifle it. So I think the All president, right. who is the minister All of right. petroleum, needs to come down and weigh in into this situation, so Nigerians can breathe some sigh of relief. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Oyalo. We understand that uh, you must run at this time to make up other appointments. So we'd like to thank you very much for your time on the program, Dr. Oyalo. Mr. Oyalo, or rather, no, Dr. Oyalo. <laughs> we're promoting you ahead <laughs> is a development. No, no, don't worry. In about six months, we'll be, we'll, we'll, we'll be done with that. So I'll be a doctor in about six <laughs> months or thereabout. All Let's right. Congratulations. So it's prophetic. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for your time on the yeah, program. Yeah, a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. If you are chosen or what? Well, just maybe. Let, 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 I think let's bring it to Dr. No, yeah. Dr. Yusuf. It, it, it's, it's quite painful. I've spoken with people that don't like Dangote. And they say, look, they feel it's a state back monopolist. But on this particular issue, this company has to succeed because of its impact on the outlook of our system as a government. This is perhaps the biggest single investment in the history of Nigeria, one of the biggest, $20 million. Billion. Billion dollars, I beg your pardon. And for the first time in a long while, somebody backward integrated what you call the import substitution. And quote and unquote, he's been, they're trying to frustrate him. How, how hard can it be to identify those who are frustrating him and deal with them? Is that a difficult thing to do? It's not a difficult thing. And, uh, you know, Kaude talked about the intervention of the president. We didn't vote for NMPC. And the activities of NMPC is impacting a whole lot on both the welfare of the citizens and on the state of the economy. So that is why I feel that the president, in his capacity, both as Minister of Petroleum and as the president of the country, needs to weigh in on this. We have, we have many multi-billionaires in this country. How many of them have put concrete production investment in place? How many of them? Some of them start their money abroad, you know, in all sorts of places. So even if it stays bad, it happens even abroad. When you have some strategic investors, government supports them. When we had COVID and uh, some key sectors like uh, automobile sectors, GM motors were having problems in the United States, government used funds from its treasury to support those industries. Because they are looking beyond the person or the company. They are looking at the bigger picture, the implication of some companies going down for the total economy. Imagine if you stop spending $10 billion annually on importation of petroleum products. Imagine the impact of that on our foreign reserves, the impact on our exchange rates, the impact on our general macroeconomic environment. Because at the heart of all of these problems is the exchange rate depreciation. Mm. Because it's a highly import-dependent economy. And the economy is highly sensitive to what is happening to exchange rates, what is happening to energy prices. So we need to tackle those two. And so, we, are almost at, at, we are almost about to turn the corner. So, Dr. Issa, and we are now having all this I, kind of back and forth. I, I know you can speak in clear terms. Yes. Some people are saying, Mele Kiara should be sacked. Benga Komolofe fired. 
the man in Farouk, uh, NNDPR, fired, the minister has fired. Is that going to change anything? Well, I, I, I don't, I, don't I, I cannot make a clear statement because I don't understand okay. the environment in which they are operating. It could be a good person, and the environment in which you are operating may be hostile to you. But what I do know is that the way things are being managed right now in that organization is not the right way. And I don't know where the interference is, where the forces are coming from. It could be about them, it mm. could be external to them. I'm not okay. in a position to say. Well, but what I do know is that we have to do things differently. Indeed. And we need to also be conscious of the social implications. Yeah. The citizens are stressed. Mm. We, need to, we need to address this issue of energy prices. Mm -hmm. We need to make it easy for people to convert their generators, their vehicles mm. to CNG, to LPG, whatever it is, yeah. to bring down the cost of energy. Yeah, and indeed, this uh, seeming lethargy in demanding accountability, either it's, it's from the NNPCL or from the president, must also be defeated such that we can get results and not keep talking about the same thing all the time. We must anchor at this point, and thank you very much for joining us. Dr. Muda Yusuf is the Managing Director, <coughs> Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprise. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you for joining us thank and you. for always coming whenever we call. Thank you. Thank you. And that's how we anchor on this edition of the program. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back again tomorrow. I am Bukola Koka. And of course, do remember, Top of the Hour will be Sunrise Daily. Thank you for watching. I'm Jeffrey Uzama. So Da Vinci, Ben Tech, Freddie, everybody who sent in their questions, well, we're able to take some of them. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. And we look to the president now, see... Uh, what will come out in the coming hours. It's a matter of urgency. But thank you for being a part of the show. I'm Kyle Vikulu. Have a great day ahead.